Welcome back to this next lecture in PLS 510, the common legumes in Kentucky, uh, and we won't be talking about alfalfa in this one, so the common legumes except for alfalfa in Kentucky. So let's get started. do want to remind you of this generalized structure of legume plants. Uh, of course, on the left would be uh, something that would be much like a red clover plant, and then on the right-hand side of this would be something that has a growth habit like white clover. The common legumes in Kentucky, the perennials that we'll talk about, are going to be alfalfa, red clover, white clover, Ceresia lespedeza, bird's foot trefoil, and sweet clover. And we will talk about alfalfa down to bird's foot trefoil uh, in this uh, next couple of sub-lectures. Among the annuals, We'll talk about annual espadiza uh, and crimson clover. Those are the annuals, but today we'll talk about annual espadiza and uh, cerecial espadiza. These legumes are almost always found with a companion grass. So now in this subsection, we're going to focus on red and white clover. And if you'll remember back to some of our earlier lectures, these are the predominant legumes present in hay and pasture fields in Kentucky. So to review a little bit, the reasons for clover, biological nitrogen fixation, improved nutritional value of hay and pasture because of the crude protein, but even more importantly, they are high in energy, higher in energy than grasses at the same stage of maturity. There are, they will improve yields when grown with grasses. Red clover in particular has the isoflavones that directly counteract the vasoconstrictive effects of toxic tall fescue and finally, soil health, the idea that they are green manure or that they add nitrogen to the subsequent crop. Red clover, the scientific name for it, is Trifolium pretense. Uh, it's a short-lived perennial legume, two to three years in our environment. Uh, it has an erect growth habit, and it's used for hay and pasture. This will give you an idea of some of the the different looks that red clover will give you. You've got the very showy round bloom that's not red, it's more of a, of a reddish pink or pink. Then you've got hairs on the stems. You've got those very large leaflets, some with watermarks and some without. So the defining characteristics of red clover are gonna be those dark pink, large round blooms. It's erect, it regrows from crowns. Uh, it has a taproot and it has hairy stems. There is some varietal difference in the hairiness of stems uh, with the variety released uh, from the UK experiment station called Freedom uh, having uh, much less hair on the stems than other varieties. And this hair on the stems contributes to dust in red clover hay. The positives about red clover, it is one of the easiest legumes to establish. It has lower fertility requirements than alfalfa, particularly pH. Uh, it grows better in summer than white clover. It has relatively high yields, and again, we've uh, listed this before, but the isoflavones that counteract tall fescue toxicosis. If you could change red clover in uh, any number of ways, one of the th first things you would do is try to give it a longer life. It has a short stand life, and we've been looking for a reliable three-year-plus red clover since 1920, and it has not been forthcoming. The hairs make for dusty hay, and that generally means that horse owners don't want to, to feed it and shouldn't feed it. Red clover can cause slobbers, that's excessive salivation caused by Rhizoctonia fungus, uh, and not the red clover plant per se, but Rhizoctonia likes to grow on red clover in the hot, humid days of midsummer. Slaphermine is the... Uh, uh, alkaloid that causes that uh, livestock to slobber, and it persists a, for a long time in red clover hay. There are at least a couple types of red clovers. The medium red clovers that uh, produce multiple harvests, that's the most prominent type of red clover. And then the mammoth or one-cut red clovers, they are single cut. The first harvest has higher yields. Uh, but the, and they will regrow, but there's not much uh, yield in those regrowth harvests. 
They are grown primarily in the more northern areas above 60 degrees north latitude, which is the northern U.S. and Canada. Switching gears to white clover, it's Trifolium repens, and that's a perennial legume. It's potentially long-lived through uh, volunteer plants or plants that spread from the original taproot. They spread, of course, by stolons, which are horizontal above-ground rooting stems. It has a low prostrate growth habit, and it's used primarily for grazing, although some ladino types, that's giant white, can be used or can contribute to hay. The positives, it lives a long time. The initial plant uh, grows from a taproot, but that initial plant can spread by stolons, and so it'll fill in. It is very high in quality to the grazing animal. The only harvested part is the leaf and the petiole, and these are very highly digestible. It tolerates a lower soil fertility than alfalfa, again mainly in the pH category, and it tolerates close grazing. If you change white clover, if you could change it, you'd up its yield. So it has lower yields compared to alfalfa and red clover and other erect type legumes. It's a poor legume in that way for hay. It is one of the leading causes of frothy bloat, and we've talked a little bit about that in class can be overly competitive and it has very poor soil holding characteristics and although this is true for pretty well all legumes. Again, we've got types of white clover. The really small or Dutch type varieties are very persistent but have limited yield and limited nitrogen fixation. Those are the native types that wind up invading our pastures and uh, ironically these are highest in the cyanide content that we talked about before but these are low values and animals are obviously acclimating to the levels of cyanide that are present in Dutch white clover. And because they're so, the yields are so low, uh, they're not getting a large amount of it anyway. And then there are the large varieties or large type, and that's the Ladino or giant whites. Uh, they have higher forage yield and nitrogen fixation, but they are usually less persistent. And recently there's been an influx of varieties known as the intermediate varieties, which are in the intermediary between uh, production and persistence or between the large and the small uh, types of white clover. Just want to give you a, a little bit of a feel for the differences in varieties uh, that you might find if you went to a dealer. Freedom is that UK variety selected for less hairiness. Kinland is a old variety, probably 50 or 60, 70 years old uh, in Kentucky that still yields well. This is in Owenton, Kentucky, uh, average over three years. Whoops, pardon me. And what I want to show you is that Cinnamon Plus, which is a southern states variety, wasn't, it wasn't the highest numerical yield in this case, but it, was, uh, it had the greatest amount of average stand after uh, three years. And I mentioned in class before that Cinnamon and Cinnamon Plus from southern states was a tremendous variety uh, available for several years, probably 10 or 15, 20 years, uh, and it was the best one in our trials nearly every time. We also include common varieties, and that would be variety not stated, uh, brown, you know, just generic red clover seed, because, of course, this is the comparison that farmers have to make, the, the, the comparison between more expensive certified seed uh, or proprietary seed and the cheaper non-certified stuff and you can tell that there's a yield difference here in this trial and that's what we've seen uh, consistently over time. This is a Lexington trial of white clovers and you can see the type of white clover is listed in the second column. The large types tend to be uh, present and have higher yields and, and actually in this case uh, have some of the higher uh, percent stands after two years. Uh, so large and then intermediate uh, clovers come next, uh, and then this intermediate was at the bottom of that trial. Let's talk a little bit about clover slobbers. This is, of course, excessive salivation in horses, especially those that are and those that have been grazing clovers of later cuttings, or uh, they've got a hold of later cuttings of hay caused by Rhizoctonia leguminicola. Black patch is the common name for this disease. It produces alkaloids, slaphromine and swainsonine, uh, and that leads to the salivation. And it can occur in all types of clover, 
more prevalent in red, and we've even documented it in Kentucky on alfalfa. This is what it looks like in horses, and that's what the fungus looks like uh, in red clover. And this is Roxoctonia fungi on alfalfa that we have just seen in the last year uh, in western Kentucky, and that's a close-up of the stem. The photograph was by Brenda Kennedy down at Princeton. So this is going to conclude our section on uh, the introduction to these uh, legumes other than alfalfa, particularly focusing on red and white clover. When we come back together, we will take up the Lespedesas and birds for trefoil. So we'll see you then.